soy la persona que en mi diario eh, cubre eh, lo que sucede en el continente, sé que es mucho continente para una sola persona, no solo soy yo, evidentemente, hay gente que está sobre el terreno, también en Sudáfrica, en, en Nairobi, pero durante los últimos años me ha tocado a mí viajar pues desde la independencia de Sudán del Sur, el brote de ébola o algún que otro conflicto eh, en la zona. ¿no? Por tanto, no puedo decir que conozca bien África, pero sí que es verdad que, que algún viaje ya me, me ha tocado hacer. ¿no? Eh, con nosotros tenemos a tres profesionales africanos, tres eminencias, cada uno en, en lo suyo. Creo que puede ser muy interesante esta, esta charla con ellos. Para mí es un honor compartir esta, esta charla con ellos. El, el nombre de esta, de esta ponencia es Si hablas de nosotros, el periodismo en África y la visión de África en el mundo. Algunas de las preguntas que he preparado serán para los tres y otras serán para cada uno de ellos. Eh, para empezar, a mí me gustaría saber, eh, volviendo a lo que decía Eric al principio en su, en su discurso, me gustaría saber eh, si estáis de acuerdo con la imagen que los medios internacionales están dando de África. Por ejemplo, Eric, comienza tú. ¿Estáis de acuerdo con la imagen que se proyecta de África en el exterior? Bueno. Well. Thank you very much, Alberto. I, um, I was hoping you would ask, uh, uh, would the pride of place should go to the lady, you know? <laughs> But, um, you know, the, there's an easy answer to your question. You know, we can, either, yeah, we can just readily say um, they're doing the best job they can. Um, every, I'm sure every journalist who's in, Afri in Africa from Spain or the UK or the United States, they're, they're giving it their best shot and they come to Africa from a cultural <coughs> environment that obviously affects how they, they write and speak. Um, and I've met a lot of really, really good uh, journalists for whom I have eternal respect. I continue to respect them. But let me, let me say this. The ultimate picture, when you, you, you know, you've read or have listened to, you've watched CNN or listened to the BBC or Radio France International or uh, read the, the newspapers, El País and others, at the end of the day, a certain image comes out. And that image is what we, we call the African narrative. What the sum total of everything is the African narrative. And we all, there's not a person in Africa who doesn't have a problem with that narrative. And that's the point. So you've got some great journalists, you, they do wonderful things, but the sum total leaves a lot to be desired. And that's what needs to change. But when we say that people tend to think, oh, they want positive stories. No, I don't want positive stories. I just want the real stuff. So I think, um, you know, there's this idea that uh, we keep speaking about, about Afro-realism. And I think it's a, it's a lovely balance to have, because you're saying, no, you don't want Afro-pessimism or optimism. Those are simplistic narratives. And, you, and you, there's been a lot of discussion today about Mo Ibrahim's idea of Afro-realism. I would take that a bit further and talk about a very nuanced idea of what the various countries, cultures, and people in Africa are about. When someone talks to me about Spain, I don't think about your political deadlock. I don't think about your troubles with the EU. I think about, quite frankly, having a wonderful time. I'm coming to Spain, I was so excited. And why is that? Because your, your, your reputation precedes you. Your reputation for being a fun country, for having wonderful food, for having wonderful music, that's what I was excited about. That's what I came to see. You know, when I heard I was coming to Spain, I was really excited about that. And then, of course, I understood the challenges your country is facing. And I think that that's what we as Africans want. You know, just see us as we are. Uh, don't, don't overstate our problems. Don't um, patronize us by saying, you're doing really well. Just, you know, see us as, as you see yourselves, as complicated, as growing, as I I complex, because that is what the many different people and cultures in Africa are. Yeah, I, I, there's um, not too much to add to that. It is very much about balance. 
it is very much about nuance. It, um, there are, I mean, if you really just looked at it very, if you looked at the numbers and you thought, what's the issue here? It's about, it's mainly about Western news organizations. Um, although more recently we've had some from China and, and Russia, but um, it's mainly about uh, Western news, news organizations. And there is, the, they, it's, I, I worked at Reuters for many years, and there's a limit to the number of journalists they have, and there's a limit to the number of stories they'll tell. Um, and they will tend to focus on the things they think that their editors want to hear back in London or, or Washington DC or New York. And um, those stories tend to disproportionately represent the continent uh, uh, and the various countries. And also, if you want to then summarize stories about Africa as against stories about Ghana or Central African Republic or South Africa or Cameroon or whatever, um, you look for common links, and those common links tend to be conflict and poverty and and then you've told, you can, it's one easy story you can wrap up. Tenía muchas ganas de escucharles, por eso rápidamente he pasado a las, a las preguntas. Verasni Pilay es eh, editora jefe del periódico Mail and Guardian, es el principal medio de periodismo independiente de Sudáfrica. Además, es experta en la gestión de redacciones y dice disfrutar mucho eligiendo al mejor equipo humano para cada historia. Eso es un lujo que, por ejemplo, en España es, es difícil que nos podamos permitir, ¿verdad? Eh, es premio de periodismo digital en África con CNN en 2012 y sus asuntos favoritos son la raza, el género y la fe en la Sudáfrica actual. Muchas gracias y bienvenida. Tenemos también a Eric Chinje, ya, se, ya lo, eh, se presentó antes cuando el discurso. Él es muchísimas cosas, además de profesor universitario, ha realizado tareas de asesoramiento a gobiernos del Congo, Liberia o Sudán del Sur en términos de estrategia y comunicación internacional. Además, es director de Africa Media Initiative y es cofundador del Foro de Líderes Mediáticos Africanos. Ha pasado por el Banco Mundial, por el World Bank Institute y ha organizado talleres de periodismo para más de 2.000 alumnos en África y Asia. Muchas gracias por venir. Eh, y Jinka Adegoke, este periodista africano, es editor de Carth África, una publicación que no solo se ha convertido en una de las más referenciadas y seguidas y además fiables del continente, sino que organiza citas como la Cumbre de Innovadores Africanos en Nairobi durante dos años seguidos eh, y además es miembro fundador del Social Media Week Lagos y del Festival Billboard Africa Music Day. Como reportero ha informado desde más de 10 países desde Europa, África y América y es colaborador habitual de The Guardian, Financial Times, CNN o BBC. Bienvenido y muchas gracias. Siguiendo con la, con la primera pregunta eh, que os he hecho, eh, yo quería saber mmm, en qué fallamos. Vosotros habéis dicho que la imagen que proyectamos de África no es exactamente, no coincide con, la, con el África real. ¿no? ¿En qué fallamos? Eh, ¿Cómo podemos mejorar eso para no incurrir en los mismos errores? I think what's already happening um, in Spain, where you, you know, as Eric was saying, we've been so impressed with the foreign journalists we've met here. When I say foreign journalists, it's your Spanish correspondents who are so passionate. And as you heard in the last session, at great personal sacrifice are going down to uh, into Africa um, get, you know, living there, getting to know the cultures, and I think that's where the change is already starting. When it comes from a place of passion, when it comes from a place of recognizing Africans and Africa as human and interesting and, and like I said, complex, and I think more of that needs to happen. I am very um, um, happy to see so many young people in this room. Um, I think a lot of you are probably students, journalism students, and I think that's exciting because they're here because they're interested in Africa. And I think that's where it changes. When you're not doing it for, from a cynical place, from a place of, oh, I have to, um, we have to cover Africa, you know? I mean, our, 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 some of our markets, we have some companies who read our paper or read our newspaper and they need to know about Africa. Mm, you know, you're going, to, you're going to get the kind of same old, same old journalism that we've been getting that simplifies Africa and only portrays its problems. When it comes out of a place of interest, out of a place of passion for Africa, 
I think that's where you're going to see change and where we are already starting to see change. There are people um, on this panel and in this room and on other panels who are far more well-traveled. Should I talk slower or louder? Slower. Louder. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Is that good? You know what? It's, a, it's the headphones. There we go. Let's take that off. That makes it a lot louder. Um, <laughs> So, so there's people um, who, in this room who are a lot more well-traveled than I am, but I think we'd all tell you that already perceptions are changing. Um, you know, when I traveled in Europe more than a decade ago, I was quite surprised at how the people of my age that I, were meeting, that I was meeting would talk about Africa. They saw it as this monolith place. And to be quite frank, we don't think about Africa as Africa in Africa. I'm not sh sure how often you walk around thinking of yourself as being European. Um, you probably don't, right? You think maybe you're from Catalan, you're from Spain, or, or wherever you're from. You don't think of yourself necessarily as being European. We don't really walk around thinking of ourselves as being African. Uh, we are, you know, we're, 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 we're a number of identities, hundreds of identities within one continent, bound by this continent that has unfortunately had terrible historical um, tragedies happen to it that have put us in a very difficult place in terms of the challenges we face, one of the most challenged continents, and that's why there's so much interest in us. But I think how we change that is by getting to know the people, getting to know the culture, and that, as I said earlier, coming out of a place of passion and interest for those people and places. It also ties into um, a, a statistic that uh, Eric brought up this morning about 80% of the stories about uh, Africa, the African Sea, are uh, from international media. You know, to also think about it another way, just to follow up with what Gorashni just said, you know, the Spanish people aren't reading about Spain based on reports from the Nigerian news agency, right? They're, they're reading about their country by their own reporters and their own journalists, and it's dominated by that. And, um, you know, it's the same sort of problem, that, you know, that we have on the continent that these stories that we're talking about um, with the much more developed Western news agencies are not using African journalists uh, who are, you know, would help them develop the nuance of the stories, right? So it's not just these fixed narratives that your editor in London has told you to go and find. So the story is already written before the journalist actually starts writing. So, and then you're just filling in blanks. You're just write, writing by numbers. Um, what you need are people to, what we do at Quartz uh, is we work a lot with young uh, journalists on the ground, young African journalists to work with international journalists as well, um, but not in a kind of uh, subservient role, but to work as partners and to, you know, to develop and strengthen sort of the journalistic standards uh, on the ground. Because that's, what, that's the only way you can tell stories um, that people on the ground especially respect and enjoy. And I, I get the response. I get response from governments. I get response from, from individuals. Just Actually, I don't care about governments, but I care about people, right? And, um, the, you know, they, they actually appreciate that, oh, right, I can see the new, you, you get it. And, that, and we need more of that, more uh, of the big uh, news agencies, um, you know, thinking a little bit wider uh, beyond just the, the, the fixed narrative they already have in mind? You know, I, I spent almost two days uh, in Madrid and interacted with a lot of Spanish journalists who are in Africa now. Pepe was the first one, you know. And, and then Gemma, who was here. Gemma, or Je Gemma, or Gemma, who was here. Uh, I spent a lot of time with... Uh, um, Angela, quite a good number of them. And you know, I keep, I, I couldn't help thinking, wow, Pepe is a guy I'd love to have a drink with. Because he just, he's, when he talks about Africa, he's, he's so ordinary. It's not extraordinary. It's not, it's not anything special. I entered, um, I went into a, um, a home in Washington many years ago. And there was this lady sitting there and everybody was just staring at her. And I, 
I was wondering, you know, because when I stepped in, she, had not, she wasn't speaking. She, she was just sitting there smiling, and everybody was staring at her. I wish I took that picture. It's in my head. That picture is still in my head 25 years later. And no, had no clue what she'd been talking about until I spoke. I was introduced by my friend. I had a friend who was, at the time, a teacher in Delaware State University. And she brought me to that house and introduced me. And then they asked me to say something, and I was talking about how I've been in the States, but I've always gone back home because life is much better back home. And they all looked at me. And then the first question was, do you have, you say you're from Cameroon, do you have lions in where you live? And then I said, well, I've, my, I saw the first lion live in the zoo in Washington. <laughs> and everybody was in shock. It was later I found out that this lady who had been a correspondent in Ghana was talking about, oh, you know, you have to be careful because on the streets, they, they come up to you, the lions. <laughs> well, you know, I later understood that she wanted to, you know, impress. So that's fine, as long as she didn't say it in her reports. But, you know, sometimes you play up to these things. You play up to expectations in, your, in how you report the story. You know, just like Richard Dowden of The Economist saying, I wrote a story that was good, but it did not jive with my editors. So they changed, they could not change the story, but they changed the title. So yeah, more papers, send us the papers, you know, you'll get the story. You'll get the right story, that's all we need. We need real people doing real stuff. A mí me, me gustaría saber, con respecto a lo que decía él, eh, ¿Por qué a los medios internacionales les cuesta tanto contar con profesionales africanos? Es decir, todos los, los compañeros que trabajamos habitualmente en África eh, nos nutrimos a base de la información que ellos dan sobre el terreno, incluso colaboramos con ellos sobre el terreno, pero luego, sin embargo, en las redacciones hay una especie de freno que impide que los profesionales, los periodistas africanos, publiquen de, manera, de una manera más internacional. Hay algunos casos que sí lo hacen, pero romper esa barrera cuesta mucho. ¿Por qué crees, por ejemplo, Eric, que eso sucede? Bueno, you have to sell the paper. And, um, you know, telling folks... Pero no será un buen periódico. Absolutely, you're right. But, you know, the, 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 the head of the news organization wants to... He's not looking at how intellectually challenged people are. He's looking at whether they put their hands in their pocket, get out the dollar or the pay, whatever, you know, the money and pay. And this, you know, so it takes a lot of courage, I think, for, to go against that grain. It takes a lot of courage. So, uh, but that's, you know, you're right. That's where excellence, that's where the great journalists shape, you know, that's where they, they earn their stripes. And we just wish, we just wish that, you know, there could be more of them. More who can, who have the courage to tell the story as it is. Have the courage to do that. Um, but then, there's always the question is of, of getting through that gatekeeper who's your editor. How do you do it? So part of the challenge of good journalism, I think, should be how you sell your story to your editor. If that's who is going to decide whether it, you know, you've got to figure out how to sell it. And that's very individual. I don't think it depends. There are no, there are no rules of that game. You, know, you have to kind of develop the trust and, um, and the confidence that your editor can have in you and sell it to him. That's where it begins, really. A very crucial point about all of this. Um, is that um, international journalism and foreign correspondents actually have a really important role to, pay, to play across Africa. And it shouldn't be uh, misunderstood that 
somehow foreign journalists are a problem or what have you. They actually have a really important role to play. And they have a role to play as partners on the ground. Um, and just to reiterate that point, not just come with a fixed narrative. Um, there, are, there are great uh, and interesting stories to tell. There are also stories that uh, the powers that be in a lot of these countries do not want reported. And um, foreign news organizations uh, in countries where the media um, might be free, as Eric described this morning, but not really free, right? They, they might be free, you know, to the point uh, I, I think he also made about uh, barons or in newspapers locally and, you know, you can essentially have whatever you want printed in these papers. Uh, the journalists don't get paid, all this stuff, and it goes on and on and on. Um, so, you know, international journalists actually can play a role, or international news organizations can play a role with African journalists. So it's not um, as if foreign journalists cannot, are of no use or are all just report, you know, bad reporters. Actually, what I find um, as someone who now recruits journalists on the ground in Africa, when I work with both local journalists and international journalists, I find that this generation of younger uh, international journalists are much more um, aware, they're much more engaged uh, than the kinds of people I think I was reading 20 years ago. Um, they, you know, they, they, they understand that they need to, you know, get in with the culture, understand the, 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 some of the language, understand some of the food, not just, you know, sit off in a, in a, in a you know, sort of colonial little quarter somewhere in the nice part of the city and then report from there. You know, so people are... A lot of young journalists, you know, they surprise me. They call me from places in Lagos. I'm like, man, I wouldn't go to that neighborhood. You went there, you know. So, so people are actually, you know, doing some of this, uh, some of this work. So I, 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 and it's easier sometimes, frankly, for some of them, sometimes, to get into certain places, uh, to have certain doors open for them. And the same, and the same way, that certain doors are going to be shut to them in terms of talking to the real people on the streets because people won't trust foreign journalists. And that's why you need to work with local journalists who can tell you, give you a full picture, tell you, you know, the complete story of what's happening on the ground. So I really struggle with this question. I'm not sure if I'm as optimistic as Yenka because, um, okay, so we're in South Africa and when, when we, we have the same problem, we try to cover the rest of the continent and we can't find African journalists. You know, so we're using foreign correspondents as an African newspaper, which speaks to the research you were doing to write African stories from across the continent, because South Africans also need, don't know enough about the rest of the continent, so you have the same problem that you have here in Spain. We want to educate them, we want to learn more about the rest of the continent. And we sit there and we struggle to find African correspondents, partly because people like Yinka are paying them too much, so we can't, we can't afford them. No, I'm joking. But, but what happens is that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But a lot, of the, a lot of the best correspondents will already be um, working for certain wires. There are so many wire agencies from across the world in Africa. So they're paying them in US dollars, so we can't afford them. And, and they're very few and far between. So you have these names, and everyone knows them who work in different countries, so everyone goes to those people. And, and I think it's become a bit of a network of privilege, because they know people, they get referrals, and the people who might be able to make it are A, not getting the proper training. This is something Eric spoke about. We don't know about them. They're good. There's people with potential. They're not making it as journalists. Mm -hmm. I think I like Yinka's point of like, you know, the ideal model, and I like what he said about this younger kind of journalists who are working with the people on the ground. I think that's a good way maybe to transfer skills so that you can then have those actual African journalists writing for international publications, because why not? Why shouldn't we be telling our stories? You know, I'm not that impressed with journalists going to hang out in gritty areas of the city. Um, you know, they, they still can't tell our stories the way we can. I, I actually get quite, quite upset about it. So we had um, a foreign journalist, and again, the foreign journalists we hang out with, um, we've been, like Eric says, are wonderful people, and I have so much respect for them. But you get a different kind of foreign journalist who just drop in and out of a country, don't bother learning the nuance, and that, that is a problem. So there was a, you know, the South African president, Jacob Zuma, He's a bit like 
George W. Bush. Oh, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a character people like to tease, and you know, he can come across as a bit of a buffoon. Um, and he's not the most popular president. So he had his third wedding, um, and, and that's really something that the Western world now is grappling with, polygamy. He's got three wives, and, and it's easy now to really mock him, you know. So he's here at his wedding. He's a proud Zulu man. He's wearing his um, skins, his, his animal skins, and he's, he's doing a dance, a traditional wedding dance. And you have these foreign correspondents watching this wedding. And as part of the dance, Jacob Zuma does this thing, and, it, and he almost looks like he's about to fall, but it's part of the dance. It's, it's, it's a cultural thing. And then he steps up again. And the foreign correspondents report that halfway through the dance, President Zuma, Zuma almost fell down. You know, age 67, he almost fell down. He could have asked Como anyone, Mugabe. you know. Like Mugabe. Uh, like Mugabe. Well, I think Mugabe, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so he didn't actually fall down. It was part of the dance. And, and he could have asked anyone. Um, and I just thought that was really poor, really poor. And then you have other foreign correspondents in, in Africa who will persistently refer to the chair of the African Union Commission, Nkosasana Dalmini Zuma, as Jacob Zuma's ex-wife. Now that is, was part of her history. She is a professional woman. She has an, a career. She has worked really hard. She's jailed a reputation for being a hard worker. She has worked hard to um, be a politician in South Africa. She went on to become the AU chair. And still you'll have foreign correspondents refer to her as Zuma's ex-wife, when that has perhaps nothing to do with the story. So that's what, where I say you need Africans telling our stories. And we can learn to tell them for an international audience. There's a bit of training necessary. So I think a lot of publications in, in, in the West will use international journalists because they understand the audiences. You can train African journalists to do the same. So I think that that training needs to happen. And, and just on the, to, fi to finalize on that point, I mean, I've had people come into my office uh, in New York who've maybe made one trip to Africa before, uh, know nothing about it, and try and pitch me stories. And I look at them and I think, you don't know what you're talking about. And then the next thing I see their bylines in the New Yorker or some New York Times, and I'm like, how did that happen? Right? How did that guy who didn't know, you know, the first thing about the, city, the country he was going to, so, you know, that, it, it bothers me that even though there are these hardworking people and people who are new, there are still, there's still a kind of easy door, at least I'm going to just speak for the Anglophone world. Uh, you know, obviously I, I know very little about what happens here, but um, definitely that still happens in, in the United States and the UK where people who, who know very little uh, are still uh, given... In España también. It happens here. <laughs> Verásni, esta pregunta es, es para ti. Eh, a mí me gustaría saber cómo, cómo os lo montáis para hacer periodismo de investigación. Imagino que tenéis tiempo para hacerlo, tenéis equipos. Y me gustaría saber qué incidencia tiene, en, en el, por ejemplo, en el poder en Sudáfrica, si, si cala eh, aquello que hacéis y, y con, qué, eso, con qué equipos contáis I think South Africa might be a bit of an exception because we have a very rich tradition and culture of, of very robust investigative journalism that has really flourished in the country. In fact, Gemma, who was on the, one of the previous panels, was, was telling me that she's not sure that you get that level of investigative journalism here in Spain, which I was very surprised by. I thought, you know, I thought it was a normal thing. I've grown up with that. And it's something a lot of us young you know, journalists aspire to, the kind of... And Mail and Guardian was, is known as, as that bastion of investigative journalism. And the reason it's, so, it's known so well is because it is powerful. It does create change. Um, investigative journalism has uncovered some of the biggest scandals in our country and has forced... Um, our governments to account for it. So things like, things like the arms deal was a massive thing for us. It, it went on for a long time. It's still going on. And, and, and that was uncovered by investigative journalism. And that was, you know, the, 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 the politician who, f who kind of first broke it and who is now an international arms deal activist, Andrew Feinstein, in his biography, he talks about how he was so enamored with the ruling party. He was part of the ruling party, the ANC, and he, he was very passionate about it. And in his book, there's a very powerful chapter where he um, has hit all these walls with trying to hold this deal to account. And he realizes something is very wrong is happening. He's an honest politician. And he's going, why am I being blocked in my, in this, you know, because he was part of parliament, legislation, trying to investigate this. And there's this very powerful moment where he looks, takes the facts and he faxes it to, um, 
to my newspaper actually, what it was then called the Weekly Mail, and he meets with a journalist, and that was his way to bring accountability. And that is a thing in South Africa, whistleblowing is, is pretty big. There's been some threats to our media freedom, but for now, um, investigative journalism is very powerful in South Africa. However, and this is the sad thing, we always thought that the threats to investigative journalism in our country would come from our government. We're always on the lookout for new legislation and we all become very uh, active about it and we, we protest if there's any legislation that tries to threaten our freedom for investigative journalism or media freedom. But the biggest threat is actually financial. So right now in South Africa, the major media houses are having retrenchments and cuts. And what happens is that everyone's moving towards digital. And, and the problem is that they want clicks. They want clicks, they want um, journalism that is fast moving and investigative journalism, the kind that changes, changes things and moves power, takes time. You need to leave a journalist alone for a few months for the, so they can break a story. And that is becoming a rarer and rarer com commodity. And that is quite sad. So, um, but we still have quite a powerful tradition. And, and, and what happens in South Africa is that we train a lot of other African journalists in investigative journalism because it is so, it is so powerful. Eric said something to, yesterday, and I thought it was so great. He said, if you want to change a government in Africa, get the people to start making a noise, and uh, such a big noise that the government can't ignore it. And it's journalism that informs the people who then make the noise. ¿Qué papel ha tenido el periodismo en determinadas, determinados movimientos ciudadanos eh, que ha habido, pues no sé, para evitar terceros mandatos en países donde la Constitución no lo permitía? Se me ocurre desde Senegal a Burkina Faso, Burundi, ahora mismo República Democrática del Congo. ¿Qué, qué papel está haciendo el, el, el periodismo en esas revoluciones? You're looking at, and uh, the role that media would play would depend a lot on a lot of other factors. You know, um, in Burkina Faso, for example, uh, the media played a major role, um, but this was because the civil society had done a lot of groundwork. There was a lot of tension in the country, um, and what media did in the end was pull the you know, you pull the facts together. You know, when people are reacting or demonstrating, they, they usually have, it's like an elephant, you know, they're looking at it from one angle and that's all they're seeing. And then media steps in and says, you know, the problem you're seeing on this side is on the other side, it's on the front side, it's on the back side. And all of a sudden they see disaster. And then civil society acts. That's happened in, 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 in many countries. Uh, but not all of them. You have a situation in Ethiopia now where I think they're possibly the most successful country, maybe next to Rwanda, that has totally, totally muzzled the press, has full control over the press. And the media folks in Ethiopia or Rwanda are totally unable to articulate uh, the, the deeper issues of, that soci of those societies, totally. So then they're, they're non-factor. But then, last week, a few days ago, there were these demonstrations in, uh, in, 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 in the Oromo lands in Ethiopia, and all that, they, they, all that the media had to do, and they've done it, is for finally state the facts. It was, you know, the situation in Ethiopia got to a point wh where um, you could no longer, the government could no longer say people, 50 people didn't die over, over nothing. That live bullets were taken to face a demonstration. Once the media got that story, the rest of Ethiopia, the rest of Ethiopia is up in arms. So there is going to be change in Ethiopia, whether we like it or not. Whether the government wants it or not, there will be change in Ethiopia. And why? Because at the right moment, the media stepped in and did the right thing. Even though it was, this is a, you know, I mean, I have a lot of Ethiopian friends. They would never, I mean, they would, you, you speak up, you know, 
if you're, if you're ready to end up in jail or, or leave the country. But they, this time around, they stepped up when they had to. Um, I think the media has always played a role, uh, but, you know, but it's hard to, you know, they've had to pick the right moment. And when they do, they get it right. When they don't, I mean, again, look at um, um, Ghana in the last elections would have gone up in flames had it not been for the media in Ghana and to some extent civil society and to some extent uh, uh, the creative industry, you know, because everybody stepped in. But Ghana would have blown up because the, the, the elections took place, and it's usually during elections, elections took place, it was almost evenly divided, and nobody was willing to give in because the same thing happened in Cote d'Ivoire. Somebody mentioned it. I think it was Gemma who talked about it. Same thing happened in Cote d'Ivoire. Ended up in war. Ended up with uh, the, the other president going to jail in, in The Hague. But the same thing happened in Ghana. And it was media that stepped in and kept talking about the need for peace and putting the blame on anybody who would act in certain ways. And that prevented people from acting and peace was in Ghana. So, you know, uh, there's no standard procedure, I guess, in any of the countries. I just want to follow that up with um, a, a little bit of a, a throw forward to look at the, a bit of the future of what we're seeing on the ground a lot with, in terms of the role of media. And the role of media is kind of changing because media is changing. And what we call media, the way people communicate, the way people stay in touch with each other is changing. So the role of social media as a media platform, particularly for situations as described here, uh, is becoming increasingly important. We're seeing, and, and you could just go through any number of countries right now, uh, from the good, you can stay with the good, you can start with, say, Nigeria, where the last elections, um, uh, it was the first time that an incumbent government had ever been voted out. But one of the things that happened that was really kind of amazing to see was how people use social media to sort of, um, when, they, when they voted, to show how many votes have been cast at each uh, voting uh, uh, center. And they put it on Facebook and they put it on Twitter to show, you know, so, so we're not going to see a different result from the one we're posting here, right? So that's on the, on the good side. And, that, and, it, and it came to pass, right? And that's fine. But you're also seeing... Um, we talked about radio earlier, where radio, um, <laughs> uh, they, you know, like Americans always talk about, you remember where you were when JFK was shot. Uh, when I was growing up in Nigeria, uh, you always remember where you were when you heard your first coup on the radio, right? When you heard the martial music and uh, the, 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 the military officer would come on and say, you know, <laughs> you know there's a new government, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but even radio is sort of, its role is sort of, diminishes somewhat because now governments know or, or coup plotters or, or governments that want to stay on in power, they, they, they go after social media now because they know that people are going to... I mean, the first, thing, first time we knew something was really going wrong in Burundi was when they started switching off WhatsApp and, and uh, social media. And you're seeing this in uh, Zimbabwe right now, um, the same sort of thing, this flag uh, protest being organized by people on WhatsApp. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on there with the new role of the new media, for, for want of a, uh, a, of a better description, because obviously that's, it's no longer new. But uh, these platforms are becoming increasingly important in the way people find, you know, learn out about what's happening in their countries and share the information uh, at, and support civil society. Cada vez que he ido a, a África, y me ha pasado en muchos países, he tenido la sensación de que la prensa en papel era la proyección de lo que quería decir el gobierno. Me ha sucedido en, en muchos sitios. Y que, sin embargo, en Internet estaba surgiendo una prensa crítica de gran calidad y que no había manera, de, por parte de los gobiernos, de frenar de ninguna manera. Pueden amenazarla, pero no la controlan, no la editan ellos. No sé qué, qué opinas tú a ese respecto, si crees que ese es el futuro y los medios impresos, como decía Eric, van a acabar por desaparecer porque son irrelevantes. I mean, this is happening everywhere. I mean, Africa is not, African countries are not any different from what we're seeing here in, in Europe or in, in the United States or wherever. Um, the economics of printing, of printing presses and, and, and paper uh, 
is always going to eventually lose out to the power of the distribution of, uh, of digital platforms. No doubt about that. Um, so, you, so you've got to think about a few things about the African continent. Um, in the last couple of years, in the last two years, smartphone penetra uh, penetration has doubled. Uh, there are now 223 million smartphones uh, in use on the continent, and it's growing rapidly. And that's, that's incredibly important. There, there are another you know, 500, 600 million people signed up with, uh, with phones, and many of them connected to the internet. Um, that's how the majority of people on the continent um, get their internet connection. And what that means, of course, is that they're able to access um, your Facebooks and your Twitters to get uh, information that is independent of the, um, the newspapers and the state-controlled radio and TV stations that uh, many of us grew up with. Um, and um, as you have these independent platforms, as the news and the tools of production become uh, more uh, available and, and cheaper for people, you know, you, remember, you have a huge youth swell in all these countries as well. And there's a ton of unemployment, as uh, Eric referred to earlier as well. And it just means that lots of very smart young people are creating um, media to uh, share information about what's going on in their local communities, in their states, in their wider regions, in their country. And that's, um, and I see that, you know, every day. I just see more and more people coming up with, you know, just amazing, very clever uh, little sort of platforms that, you know, some of which I try to support because I just think there's so many talented people who, uh, if just given some assistance or given some advice, can create uh, some, you know, the next um, uh, media uh, uh, giants for Africa. Um, and digital will enable that because they don't have to go and get, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment to, to start uh, a printing you know, press. They can, they can just do it online. Um, okay, there's still gonna be issues about standards and ethics and all that kind of stuff still needs to be ironed out. But in terms of the opportunities, um, there are now you know, more opportunities than ever. And again, if you want to think about where Spanish media comes in or Spanish press, there, these, there are some of these platforms out there to support and work with as well, which can also you know, uh, create uh, great stories Uh, for the continent. Me gustaría preguntarle a Eric que ha dedicado muchos años a, a formar estudiantes de periodismo. A mí me gustaría saber qué valores eh, te empeñas en enseñarles. I have this uh, young woman in Uganda um, who came up to me uh, not long ago and said, about a year ago now, and said, can you mentor me? And um, I said, sure, with pleasure. So I'm, I'm mentoring this young woman now, as I do a few others across the continent. And I told her, I said, look, think about your country. Think about what you want to see happen in that country. But don't, don't be your own judge. Talk to people you think know better than you do. Talk to them. Draw from them as much as you can. But do what you believe firmly is right by your country. Think about, she's on television, I said, think about those who watch you. And give them the best you can to influence who they become, to influence what they know of the country. You are in a rare position as a journalist to inform both sides. And if you can bring your, the best of you to that job, it doesn't matter. You, you're criticized, you're punished, that no longer matters. Now, she goes home, to, we're, we're having this discussion in, uh, in, in Nairobi. She goes back to Uganda and she does a story, which she, you know, she does a story on the police. And they write to her boss saying that story, you know, she should never, that story should not go on the air again because they're going to repeat it or something. And 
asked that she should be given a warning. So she called me and said, look, now I have a warning. My job is threatened. What do I do? I said, why, 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 why is your job threatened? Oh, you know, it's this story. I did it this way, blah, 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 and I thought it was the best I was doing. And now you've put me in, in trouble. I, I said, wow, her name is uh, Remy. I said, wow, wow, Remy. You finally earned your first stripe. But it's a very small stripe. You need a bigger one. And you need to earn more. Oh, you know, Uganda is not like Kenya, blah, blah, blah. I said, I've just told you what I think. You've earned your stripe. If you want to earn more, you've got to do more. So she did. And she was picked up. The police picked her up. She now calls again. Oh, Rosebell is in the room. You know the story, I think. Yes. Yeah. Now, she says, uh, now they've picked me up. My parents are worried. You know, I'm definitely not going to get this job again, and blah, blah, blah. I said, wow, you've earned your second stripe. You're doing very well, my dear, you know. And this young woman is coming up with amazing stories. And now they're leaving her alone. You know, so the, the story of the journalist doesn't always end up that good. You know, there are those who actually end up in jail and end up in jail for a long time. There are those who even get killed. I, I tell journalists, of all things, the most important thing is to be safe. But don't run away from the difficult story. You get bitten, you get arrested, you're released, but don't run away from that good story. And most importantly, balance. Remember that word balance. Remember something else? Research and data. Once you have you know, even the guy who comes and even kills you but if he knows that he killed you for the truth, I mean I hope it never gets to that, but once and the truth is always comes with that element of balance of data that's well researched if you have those on your side and if you've done your, your homework of verifying those facts, then you're totally fine. That's all I, that's all I want to see in a journalist. Bueno, tengo mucha curiosidad, lo primero, y imagino que la, la siguiente mesa lo resolverá, porque en España los, eh, las redacciones de periódicos están llenas de mujeres, pero se pueden contar con los dedos de una mano las que son jefas. Espero que la siguiente eh, mesa lo, te pregunte su, su opinión. A mí me gustaría saber qué se puede hacer con respecto a lo que decía Eric, para evitar o para presionar a gobiernos como el de Eritrea, el de Etiopía, el de Ruanda, que encarcela a periodistas durante años eh, por hacer su trabajo y si existe alguna asociación de periodistas africanos que pueda presionar a la Unión Africana o a algún organismo internacional para que intente hacer algo. So, can I just understand, are you asking about women specifically or just media freedom generally? Yo recuerdo, porque las he entrevistado, casos de periodistas en, en Ruanda que han podido estar ocho años en la cárcel simplemente por hacer su trabajo y me da la sensación que salvo asociaciones como Reporteros Sin Fronteras se ha hecho muy poco para, para atajar esa situación. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think um, a lot more needs to be done. Um, there, are, there are international organizations, like, like you say, Reporters Without Borders. Um, there's another organization based in New York, which my predecessor has just gone to head up. I think it's called uh, a Journalist Rights or, or Freedom for Journalists or something like that, who, who fight for journalism rights. But um, you're absolutely right. When, when journalists are, are threatened, imprisoned, um, you know, kidnapped and, and, and assaulted, there is... It generally, it's up to us as other journalists to try to make a noise about it. You saw what happened with the Al Jazeera journalists. It took so long. We all had to make a noise about it to try to get that, um, g get that kind of information out there and get people to act. So there, there probably does need to be more. And unfortunately, I think what happens is that if a government doesn't care about its journalists and it treats its journalists like that, it's, it's very hard to get them to, to, to intervene in that situation. You need people to... Um, 
to really make a lot of noise to get governments like that to change. Um, you know, thankfully in South Africa, there is such a culture and tradition around journalism that if there's any, um, if, there's, if anyone lays a hand on a journalist, they, there is a big uproar. There would be a big uproar. I, I remember once an investigative journalist was taken in for questioning. It happened several years ago. It was the only incident I can really remember. And there was a massive uproar. So you need that kind of sensitivity in a society to um, create that kind of uproar. Um, you mentioned me being a woman. I, I'm not sure if the question was also around how, if that puts women off. Is, is sure. that what you're asking? Okay. So um, absolutely, I can imagine that women across the continent would be very put off by that kind of thing, especially if they have children and families, to know that they might be uh, kidnapped. And you know, it's not just in Africa. I was at the World Editors Forum earlier this year, and there was a Mexican journalist, and, and, and the things she was saying about how women are threatened in the field, and how her colleagues are kidnapped, and it, it's terrifying stuff, absolutely terrifying. Um, I think, I think the, the stuff that prevents the rise of women to the top of, of media industries across the world, but particularly in Africa, is perhaps a little bit more mundane. It's, it's often just... Um, Sexism, you know, it's 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 a uh, it's, it's difficult for for women to be taken seriously in very patriarchal societies. I find that you have to act like a man a lot of the time if you want to get further. And women who are very talented, who are, uh, you know, who are great at what they do, if they don't present in a certain way, if they're not a little bit aggressive, if they just happen to be softly spoken or happen to just be the kind of person who's not aggressive, they might not go very far. I happen to, you know, you need to be a little confrontational, a little bit aggressive to make it in, in societies that are patriarchal, unfortunately. And, you know, I firmly believe that if, if my government did not have policies and laws and legislations in place that promoted women and people of color, I wouldn't be where I am. Because there is an onus on businesses, media businesses in South Africa, to promote women, to make sure that there's more women, in, and you know, we call them um, affirmative action policies. Those old boy networks would prevail. So I think if there isn't a buy-in at the top of society, you're not gonna see that change happening because patriarchy is so entrenched, yeah. To the, um, the issue of uh, danger to journalists, it's a, it's, a, it's a very real problem, it's a very real threat, and we're working on a story Right now, um, uh, in Kenya, where the, the elections are coming up, and already uh, journalists are already, I mean, the, the election is not till next year, and, and journalists, uh, local journalists, are already being threatened and, and harassed uh, by the, you know, the various sides. So, um, and even, you know, so e even in countries where you think the press is, is free, this kind of stuff goes on quite a lot. Uh, we, I'm sure you probably get the emails from, uh, uh, the, uh, from CPJ, the Committee for Protection of Journalists. Um, uh, you know, countries like Ethiopia, like you, like you said, and um, some other ones in Rwanda. Rwanda's like, got it on such a lockdown, we don't even know that <laughs> when, when anything happens there. But, um, you know, it's real. It's a, it's a problem I, you know, I, I've had someone write for me before and just got strange phone calls. So I just was like, I can't, I can't risk having you, anything happen to you. So it's, it's, it's a real problem in, in certain countries. Um, again, this is why international press uh, has a role. Again, to our earlier conversation, it's why you guys don't always get visas easy, easily when you say you're a journalist. Um, you know, it, um, so yes. It's a problem, and it's one that, um, to Varashni's point, we should make sure we, we with, our, with, the, with, the, with the platforms that we have, we make as much noise as possible. Um, uh, we get ahead of the story, which is why we're doing this Kenya story, before it becomes like, you know, some guy has disappeared for, for one month mm -hmm. or something. Start talking about it now um, and uh, keep on doing that best we can do that's the platform we have it's i mean everything we've said here is true about uh, the issue of safety and also the um our ability to intervene uh when a journalist is in uh, uh is in trouble the, the the best the best um uh, mechanisms i think that for doing that exist abroad for the most part but there's a lot going on in africa now um, there's a, a guy in Zambia only a few weeks ago, um, 
the Post, which is the country's most important paper, was shut down. And it took the intervention, my organization, IPI in, the, um, in, in Vienna, and uh, CPJ in uh, New York, it took all three. Uh, you know, all of us actually went to Zambia, to Lusaka. But there was a lot of sympathy for what we had to say, a colleague of mine who went. There was a lot of sympathy in Zambia when he told the government, because they, they received us, and he said, look, you can shut this paper down. It doesn't really, you know, it, it punishes uh, Fred Mbembe, the guy who's own, who owns it, and the 10 or 20 people that work for him. You've achieved that. But have you tried to estimate what the, the impact of this on your country? All of a sudden, Zambia is one of the problem countries in Africa. All of a sudden, the investors who may have been thinking about Zambia, this, you know, they're seeing another banana republic. Um, and on and on and on. And the, the government understood that. Um, the story of Ethiopia is well known. So many journalists in jail. We went with a group again to Ethiopia. And they let us see the journalists. But we realized something, that even in government, there was total division. The minister, the, the minister who took, took, took our team, he was, I mean, he got so frustrated. I thought he was going to leave government because he couldn't understand what, why some, some people who have a hold on leadership were adamant. They should not see the journalists. They should not even talk to them. And every time we would go one step, we'd, he'd be reminded about that. No, these guys are not supposed to see the journalists. So, you know, there's... All of this, is, there's no homogeneous, there's no single approach that works for all countries. Uh, it's uh, safety of journalists, ability for journalists to work in, in countries. I mean, if Donald Trump, think about it, if he had his way in the US, he'll pick them up. I'm sure when that guy gets to the White House, he'll pick up journalists. And Americans will be scandalized, but it'll, be, it'll happen. So, you know... Um, uh, I think we, we, we just have to keep pushing. We just have to keep pushing, and I can guarantee you, I can tell you, a lot is happening in Africa. We have a meeting in a, in two, in a few weeks, in about a month, where every country will be represented by senior editors. We're going to be talking. It's all Africans. Every of the 54 countries will be represented at that level. It's the first time it's going to happen. And we're going to be talking about these issues. How we can put the spotlight on problems when a journalist is arrested. How can we weigh in when elections threaten the peace? How, you know, so as a group, we want to talk about the issues that Africa faces and what media can do to change them. So you know, there's a lot going on on the ground right now. And, but, The problems are real. Me dicen que se nos ha acabado el tiempo. Si me gustaría que recibieran un aplauso ellos tres, muchas gracias a los tres. Eric, Verasni y Dinka. Muchas gracias por todo.